Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Mario Stiva from the University of Oxford, who will tell us about the combinatorial perspective on geometric inequalities. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. A pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the combinatorial perspective on geometric inequalities. And I should mention that um, all of this is based on joint work with uh, Professor Alicia Figali at ETH and uh, Dr. Peter Van Hintum, who is just finishing now. Um, let me start by saying that uh, there is a vast literature on geometric inequalities and functional inequalities, and this is a very active research area connected with a bunch of uh, uh, important fields connected with analysis, convex geometry, calculus of variation. Um, and I think without a doubt, the um, most famous and oldest um, geometric inequality is the isopermetric inequality. Uh, that I'm sure you are all familiar with. And this in the plane just says that of all regions of a given area, the disk has the smallest perimeter. For example, uh, square of area one has perimeter four, a disk of area one has perimeter two root five, which is like 3.5. Um, now, the size of pegmetric inequality is just one of a very large body of um, important geometric inequalities that are connected to each other. And this include uh, the Brun-Minkowski inequality, Brekopa-Leinler inequality, Borel-Braska-Blib, discrete uh, isopermetric inequality, Sobolev inequality, and the list goes on and on. I hope to touch on a couple of these in my 50 minutes. Um, now, I want to straight away to, to talk about um, uh, very important um, research happening in this area. And to do so, I want to throw at you an equivalent form of the isopermetric inequality. This says that if I is a region of area pi, then I has perimeter at least two pi. And the quality happens if and only if I is a disk of radius one. By the way, I was slightly vague with what I mean by a region. I, I essentially mean any shape that is enclosed by a simple curve, no loops, um, that's it. Um, so a major problem in, um, in this area is the so-called uh, stability problem or the inverse problem, which in the case of the eyes of inequality relies on the following principle, that if we are close to equality in the eyes of inequality, then the region I is close to being a disk. And the results in this direction seek to quantify the two notions of closeness. And to give you a gist, I want to mention a classical result on, that's 100 years old of Bonasen. This says that if I is a region of area pi with perimeter at most 2 pi plus delta, so close to the absolute minimum, then I is sandwiched between two concentric disks of radii 1 minus root delta and 1 plus root delta. So in other words, I is very close to being a disk of radius one. Um, and to justify perhaps where this uh, root delta comes from, let's take the, the example of an ellipse with major and minor axis, one plus root delta and one over one plus root delta. This has area pi and has perimeter on the order of two pi plus delta. And obviously this ellipse is sandwiched between a circle of radius one over one plus root delta and one plus root delta. So this is where the, the root delta comes from. And to, um, I, I, I want to begin this discussion by showing you a lovely proof of this um, result of Bonesen. Um, that's purely geometric. So we are given a region R of area pi and perimeter two pi plus delta, and we want to show that this region is sandwiched between two concentric disks of radii one minus root delta and one plus root delta. Now, what's the obvious difficulty? The obvious difficulty is that we have no clue where the center is. So we have to take an educated guess of where the centers of the circles should be. And here's a perhaps counterintuitive guess that um, should become clear in a moment. Let's take a segment XY that divides the region I into uh, two equal parts in the sense that the segment XY divides both the area and the perimeter into equal parts. Not trivial that this segment always exists, but fun exercise to, to check that it always exists. Now we are going to take the 
the uh, cell drive to be the midpoint of this segment X1. And here's why this is a, a good choice of a cell. Um, because we can construct now from R two, um, two other regions, R prime and R double prime as follows. We can construct these regions by raising one half of R and reflecting the other half in the origin. For example, we construct R prime by, from R by erasing the left half and reflecting the right half in the origin by the choice of the segment XY, which divides I into halves. We have that R, R prime and R double prime have exactly the same area pi and the same perimeter two pi plus delta. But R prime and R double prime are symmetric in the origin. So now to show that R is sandwiched between two concentric disks at the origin is equivalent to showing that R prime and R double prime are sandwiched between two concentric disks at the origin, because R is sort of a hybrid between R prime and R double prime. So now we have the advantage, we reduce the problem to uh, symmetric regions, R prime and R double prime. So let's assume that R is a symmetric region in the origin and seek to show that R is sandwiched between two concentric disks at the origin with radii, radii one minus with delta and one plus with delta. Or in other words, we have to show that for any segment PQ through the origin, the length of PQ is between two minus root delta and two plus root delta. Okay, so let, let's fix one such segment PQ. And perhaps let's focus on the top half. Because the region is symmetric, the top half has area pi over two, has perimeter pi plus, red perimeter, I guess, pi plus delta over two. And we would like to evaluate the length of PQ from this. Well, the, the trick is to compare this against a sector of a disk. So let, let's construct a sector of a disk that has coiled PQ and has area pi over two. I claim that this sector of a disk has red perimeter at most pi plus delta over two. And actually this again follows from the isoperimetric inequality because if we um, make the disk whole and if we copy the bottom on the left, then these two regions have exactly the same area. Um, and because the right region is a disk, then it turns out that the right region has smaller perimeter than the left region. Um, in particular, because the bottom coincides, the right region has um, smaller red perimeter than the, red, than the left region. So the moral of the story is that we have a, we, we consider a disk um, with a coiled PQ, the sector of a disk above PQ has area pi over two and has red perimeter at most pi plus delta over two. Now it's a, just a trigonometric problem to express the length of PQ in terms of the area and the perimeter and check that indeed PQ is um, between two minus root delta and two plus root delta. I'm not going to write down the formula, but in principle, one, one could just write down the trigonometric formula for PQ and check this. And thus conclude that indeed PQ has the desired bounds. Uh, before I move on, I just want to say one, uh, one quick, um, quick remark about this. Namely, of course, the isoperimetric inequality also holds in higher dimensions. You, would correctly guess that the stability of the isoperimetric inequality uh, holds in higher dimension. Um, and indeed, this was proved in 2007 by Fusco, Maggi, and Pratelli. Um, but it turns out that higher dimensions are much more difficult than uh, uh, the plane. And this was a remarkable achievement. Well, the inequality that I actually want to talk about is the Brunning-Kosky inequality, which is closely related to the isoperimetric inequality, as I'm sure all of you know. The Brunning-Kosky inequality actually implies the isoperimetric inequality. Um, and to, to state it, 
let me introduce the notion of a subset. Um, so given two sets A and B in Euclidean space, we define the set A plus B to be all, all um, uh, elements of the form X plus Y with X in A and Y in B. Now, this appears supernaturally in geometry because if I take B to be a ball of radius I centered at the origin, then A plus B is just a um, the so-called I neighborhood of A is the set of all that we think this does out from B. What does the Brun-Minkowski inequality say? Well, the, the Brun-Minkowski inequality is a fundamental tool in complex geometry and analysis that relates the size of the subset to the sizes of the individual sets. And to state it precisely, let me actually switch to the notion of the average of two sets. So the Brun-Minkowski inequality says that if I have a parameter d between 0 and 1, and I have two sets a and b in r to the d, and crucially a and b have the same form, then the average ta plus 1 minus tb has size at least size of a. So in particular, the size of a plus b over 2 is at least the size of a. And just for the simplicity of exposition, um, let me focus on the case t is 1 half. Um, what about the quality? Well, equality holds if and only if A and B are convex and equal up to translation. Um, so by convex, I mean that, well, I is convex if whenever I have two points X and Y in I, then um, the entire line segment X, Y is also in I. Left potato convex, right potato not convex. Um, so we have equality whenever A and B are convex and equal up to translation. Let me do a couple of examples to, uh, to, to have in mind. So when A and B are, say, this green equilateral triangle, um, it turns out that A plus B over 2 is also this uh, green triangle. And that's because A plus B over 2 consists of all points Z that are the midpoint of a segment XY with X and Y in the triangle. Okay, but obviously if X and Y are in the triangle, so is the midpoint Z. Um, so in this case, A plus B over 2 is equal to A. We have exact equality in Brun-Minkowski. And surprise, surprise, that's because the triangle is convex and the sets are equal. If we just translate A and B into space um, without changing the shape, then we actually don't do much. We just translate the average. So with respect to, to size, it makes no difference. Let's do one more example. If A and B are this green annulus, then I claim A plus B over 2 is the entire outer disk. That's because A plus B over 2 consists of all points Z that are the midpoint of a segment X, Y with X and Y in the green annulus. OK, but actually, for any point Z, even for points in the white inner disk, it's clear that you can find the segment X, Y such that Z is the midpoint of X, Y. For example, consider the, the line perpendicular to OZ and extend it until it intersects the annulus. All right, so in this case, A plus B over 2, clearly bigger than A. Um, we have strict equality, and that's because the annulus is not convex. Let's do one final example. Say A and B are the rectangles 1 minus delta by 1 plus delta and the other way around, 1 plus delta by 1 minus delta. Then I claim that A plus B over 2 is just the squared 1 by 1. And just to check um, the sizes, we have that A and B have size 1 minus delta squared. A plus B over 2 has size 1. Um, we have strict equality. And again, that's because A and B are not equal, not even up to translation. Oh. Um, now, as I mentioned before, a major problem in this area is the so-called stability problem or the inverse problem. And in the case of the Brun-Minkowski inequality, this builds on the following principle, that if we are close to equality, then A and B are close to being convex and equal up to translation. And the results in this direction seek to quantify the two notions of closeness. And to give you a gist, let me state two folklore conjectures concerning Brun-Minkowski. 
first one says that if we are delta away from equality uh, in Brunikovsky, then A and B are root delta away from being uh, equal sets. More precisely, if A plus B over 3 is at most 1 plus delta times A, then the symmetric difference between A and B is on the order of root delta times A, up to translation. Um, so to convince you, let me, um, le let's revisit the example of the rectangles. This time, let's take them to be 1 minus root delta by 1 plus root delta and vice versa. So A and B have area 1 minus delta. A plus B over 2 is the square, um, and it has area 1. What's the symmetric difference between A and B? Well, it's this blue region on top, and it's going to be on the order of root delta minus delta. Um, and because delta is small, this is on the order of root delta. So this is where the root delta comes from. Let me tell you about uh, the second folklore conjecture. This says that if we are delta away from equality, then A and B and delta away from being convex. So more precisely, if a plus b over 2 is at most 1 plus delta times a, then the distance between a and its convex hole, um, smallest convex set containing it, is on the order of delta times a. And similarly, the distance between b and its convex hole is on the order of delta times a. Uh, to see why we should expect something like this, let's look at the annulus again. So say A and B are this green annulus of area one with a hole in the middle of area delta. Then A plus B over two is the entire outer disk. It has area one plus delta. So we are delta away from equality. Um, now, um, what, what's the distance between A and this convex hall? How much mass do we need to add to A to make it convex? We need to fill the hole in the middle. So we need to add delta mass. So the distance between A and this convex hole is delta. Now, I should say that this folklore conjecture is a um, major problems in the field of geometric inequalities and very important problems in analysis. And there, there has been quite, quite a lot of work done in this direction. And I want to mention some of this work. So, um, you know, uh, in a big breakthrough, Figali, Maggi, and Pratelli used mass transportation techniques to resolve the first folklore conjecture when A and B are convex, the quadratic con conjecture when A and B are convex. Then Figali, Maggi, and Monet resolve the case when A is a ball and B is arbitrary. And uh, Barchese and Julien extended this to the case when A is convex and B is arbitrary. So, all of this assume one of the sets to be convex and um, the other one to be arbitrary. Um, what about the general situation when both sets are arbitrary? Well, it turns out that um, the general situation is much more difficult and not, not quite amendable by mass transportation techniques. Figali and Jerison had a um, very important result in this direction. They showed some quantitative bounds um, that are qu quite far from optimal, but still some quantitative bounds. So they showed bounds of the third, the symmetric difference between A and B is at most delta to a double exponential in the dimension. And this is where we came into the picture. So in the formation with the uh, Peter Van Hintum, Hunter Spink, myself, we resolved both conjectures in the plane. And in the formation with Alicia Figali, Peter Van Hintum, and myself, we resolved both conjectures in all dimensions. And I should point out that the proof in high, the higher dimensions, not surprisingly, turned out to be much more difficult than the plane and the proof side completely different. Oh, and just to mention one other result, in the formation with Peter Van Hintum, Hunter Spink, and myself, in the case of equal sets, um, we also considered the op optimal constants, which we established in small dimensions, and we obtained some asymptotics in higher dimensions. Um, so to state, uh, to state our main results uh, precisely, 
Um, we showed that um, if A and B have the same volume, that, and if uh, the average TA plus one minus TB is at most one plus delta times A, then up to translation, the symmetric difference between A and B is on the order of root delta over T times uh, the size of A. And this is shot both in the exponent of delta and in the exponent of T prioritized in this order. The example with the rectangles shows uh, the sharpness. And our other main result um, says that in the same circumstances, the distance between A and the convex hole um, and the distance between B and its convex hole is on the order of delta times A, which again is sharp in the exponent of delta um, as uh, is indicated by the example of the elements. Now, for the rest of the talk, which uh, is uh, uh -huh. oh, plenty, plenty of time. Sorry, what was there a question? Ah, sorry, I, I thought there might have been a question. Yeah, but for, for the rest of the talk, I want to show you a proof of our first main theorem, which is the uh, square root stability result. And let me let me just start to set the scene um, by um, discussing the usual proof of the Brun-Minkowski inequality. So the, oops, the Brun-Minkowski inequality just says that if A and B have the same volume, then the average A plus B over two has a size at least the size of A. And let's assume that A and B are just finite unions of boxes, always by abstract nonsense we can reduce to finite unions of boxes. Well, what's the strategy? Well, we want to do parallel hyperplane cuts to partition A and B into a bunch of small pieces. How do we do these cuts? Well, take, um, take I mean, imagine A and B are in the plane. So take a line that divides A into A plus and A minus. Take a, a parallel line that divides B into B plus and B minus and crucially arrange it at a height so that the top have the same size and the bottom have the same size. And then repeat this procedure. So take another line that divides the top into A1 and A2, take a parallel uh, line that divides the top of B into B1 and B2, um, arrange it so that A1 and B1 have the same size, A2 and B2 have the same size and repeat this again and again. Now, I claim that by construction, AI and BI have the same size. Um, the, sorry, the, at the end, the partition that we produce, AI and BI have the same size. And actually more than that, I claim that AI plus BI over two are all disjoint. Um, to convince you of that, let, let's do just one cut and um, let's look at the average of, let, let, let's say we cut A at height Y1 and we cut B at height B, uh, Y2. I claim that the average of A plus and B plus is completely disjoint of the average of A minus and B minus. But that's just because the average of A plus and B plus is above this mid red line, whereas the average of A minus and B minus sits beneath this red line. So they live in different parts of the world. And this sort of propagates in the process. Now, what's the second step? Well, now that we uh, partition A and B into a bunch of pieces, um, we want to prove the Brun-Minkowski inequality for each of these pieces, for the AI and BI. So we want to show that the average AI plus BI over two has size at least size of AI. Why do we believe we might be in a better position to do this? Well, if we do enough cuts, because A and B are just unions of boxes, if we do enough cuts, the pieces, A, I, and B, I, just become boxes themselves. Um, and presumably for boxes, this is trivial to prove. To, to prove. Um, though I'm not going to do it. So now we'd like to glue all the pieces together and conclude that the average of A and B is at least the sum of the averages of AI and BI. 
which by the pruning cost inequality in each of the pieces is at least the sum of ai, which is the size of it. And this completes the proof of the pruning cost inequality. Now, with that in mind, let's turn to the stability of the Brunikovsky inequality. Well, besides, let's turn to uh, our, our first, um, first theorem, which says that if we are delta away from equality, then up to translation, the symmetric difference between A and B is on the order of root delta times A. And let's try to emulate the same proof. Okay, so let's proceed as before. Let's assume A and B are just unions of boxes. Again, no harm done there. Let's do parallel cuts to partition A and B into a bunch of small pieces. Just as before, we will have AI and BI to have the same size. AI plus BI over two are all disjoint. And perhaps let's also keep track of the doubling. So let's say that AI plus BI over two is one plus delta times AI. Now, it's quite silly, but um, it's useful to note that we can control delta i in terms of delta. In some sense, delta i average to delta. That's because by hypothesis, we know one plus delta times a has size at least a plus b over two, which is at least sum of a i plus b i over two, because all of this are disjoint which is equal to one plus delta, the sum of one plus delta i times a i, just by definition. Uh, so actually uh, the ones cancel and we are left with the fact that delta a is at least the sum of delta i a i. Um, so I'm sort of imagining that the delta i is on average are equal to delta. Now let's move to the second step as before. We have this small pieces, AI and BI. We'd like to prove a Brun-Minkowski stability of this AI and BI. So we'd like to show that there is some translate Z such that the symmetric difference between AI and Z plus BI is on the order of root delta I times AI. Why do we believe we are in a better position to do this? Again, we did enough cuts that the pieces AI and BI are just boxes, presumably for boxes. Again, this is simple to, to do. So what, now we like to glue everything together and conclude that um, the symmetric difference between A and Z plus B is controlled by the sum of the symmetric differences between AI and Z plus BI, which is controlled by the sum of root delta I times AI. Uh, square root is concave convex, one of those. Um, so because delta i is average to delta, this means that this in turn is controlled by root delta times the size of a. And we are done. Now this would be all nice and beautiful, except that it's wrong. And it's wrong because there is no reason for this translate z i to be the same. In other words, we might be in a position to prove that up to some translate z i, the symmetric difference between a i and z i plus b i is small. But there's no reason why this translate z i need to be the same. For example, of course, you can translate a1, so it perfectly overlaps b1. You can translate A2, so it perfectly overlaps B2. But there's no, no way to translate, to, to do this simultaneously, to translate A1 and A2 simultaneously to overlap B1 and B2. And actually, in general, it's even worse than that. Not only that the translates are not the same, but if I give you two shapes, A and B, and I ask you for the optimal translate that minimizes the symmetric difference, there's no way to get a good grip on what that translate is. It's hard to guess what it is. However, for certain sets, for certain shapes, maybe we can guess what that optimal translate is. And this brings me to the ideas of cones and cone-like sets. So what's a cone? A cone is exactly what you expect. A cone with a vertex and a origin will always have cones with vertex and origin. It's just the intersection of a bunch of half spaces where the hyperplanes just uh, go through the edge. So in the plane, a cone is just an egg. 
no, nothing fancy. What's a cone like Z? Well, a ZX in C is 100 C like. If it's sandwiched between the ball of radius 1 over 100 and the ball of radius 100, center the village. So, in other words, a set um, is cone like if it's not too, sque too squished or too, in, 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 if it's somewhere in between the two balls. Um, I should also say that the cones we work with um, could be super narrow, but they are not too wide. They are at most, uh, you know, 100, uh, or at most 179 degrees in the plane. Um, right, now why do we care about cone-like sets? We care about cone-like sets because for cone-like sets, we can have a pretty good guess at, at what the optimal translate is that minimizes the symmetric difference. And here's, here's the, the result. Say we have a cone C and two cone-like sets inside C. And say we are in the usual setup, X and Y have the same size, X plus Y over two is at most one plus delta times X. And say that we are told that for some mysterious translate Z, the symmetric difference between X and Y plus Z is small. Then it turns out that the symmetric difference between X and Y themselves is also small. So in other words, the optimal translate is the zero translate up to um, multiplicative uh, factors. Yet, in other words, the best way to place the, the sets um, in the plane is with the vertex and the origin. Now, um, perhaps, let me check how much time I have. Ooh, I'm doing good on time. So uh, let me say a couple of words about why we should expect this to be true. So. Let's take, um, let's look at the sets X and Y plus Z. Oh, and let, let's take an affine transformation so that the angle of the cone is 30 degrees. We can always do that. This in particular forces the sets X and Y to have essentially constant size because we are sandwiched between two balls of radius one over the hundred and the hundred. Now, I want to investigate this translate Z. Um, how big can Z be? I claim that Z, the size of Z, is on the order of root delta. Now, to show that, it's enough to show that this heights H1 and H2 are on the order of root delta. And let me justify why, why H1 is on the order of root delta. Let's consider this red region here. So let me unpack a bit. This red region is um, inside the symmetric difference between X and Y plus Z. More, more precisely, it's in this guaranteed part of X. Uh, so it's in X intersecting with the ball of radius 100. And yet it's outside the translated cone C plus Z. That's why it's inside the, the symmetric difference between X and Y plus Z. Now, what do we know about this region I? Well, because it's in the symmetric difference of X and Y plus Z, um, and we know this symmetric difference to be small, we know that the region I has size on, of order root delta. Now, what else do we know about this region I? Well, it's essentially a trapezoid with base with the long base one over a hundred, um, angle 30 degrees, and height h1. Okay, but a region like this has area essentially constant h1. So it must be that h1 is comparable to root delta. And similarly, we can show that h2 is uh, at most root delta. So this concludes the, the claim that z is on the order of root delta. So what's the point? We have the sets X and Y plus Z. We know that the symmetric difference between X and Y plus Z is small. We also know that Z is small. So we'd like to say, should if we jiggle a tiny bit Y plus Z so that it becomes Y, 
we don't mess a, a lot with the symmetric difference. Um, we'd like something of the form that the symmetric difference between X and Y is controlled in terms of the symmetric difference between X and Y plus Z and the size of Z. Um, except that this is completely false. In general, even the tiniest perturbation could change drastically the symmetric difference. However, however, not all is lost. This is true in the case of convex sets. Um, now, are X and Y convex? Uh, they're not. They're not convex. But, good thing, our other main theorem says that X and Y are very close to, be, to being convex, which is close enough so that this actually holds. Um, so, indeed, the symmetric difference between X and Y is controlled in terms of the symmetric difference between X and Y plus Z and the size of Z. And uh, we get that this is of order root delta, which is exactly what we want. Okay, so what's the moral of the story? Yeah, the moral of the story is that uh, for cone-like sets, we know exactly what the optimal translate is, is the zero translate. So with this in mind, let's try to, to revise our um, We still want to do hyperplane cuts to partition the space into a bunch of cones. <clears throat> and we'd like to uh, produce um, arbitrary narrow cones with the vertex at the origin. Now, what do we like? What do what properties we would like about these cones? Well, we'd like that inside the cone CI, the sets AI and BI are a hundred CI like a cone like. And as usual, we'd like that in each of these regions, in each of these cones, the sets AI and BI to have the same size. So in this picture at the bottom, we see a partition into four cones. Uh, so that in each of the cones, the sets AI and BI have the same size, and um, the cones AI and BI are 100 cone-like. Now, why do we want this? Because now when we move to the second step and we um, prove a uh, minkowski stability for the sets AI and BI, so when we show that up to some translate ZI, the symmetric difference between AI and ZI plus BI is small, well, now we have a very good guess of what that optimal translate is. That optimal translate is going to be the zero translate. So now all the translates go inside and we can glue all the pieces together to conclude the stability for A and B from the stabilities from, from AI and BI. Let me comment a tiny bit on the two conditions. I think the more scary looking condition is the first one that we need to produce a partition into cones um, with vertex at the origin, so that in each cone, uh, the sets AI and BI are 100 cone line. But actually, as it turns out, this condition is very easy to satisfy. Um, it turns out that uh, what essentially no cost, we can always assume that the sets A and B themselves are sandwiched between the ball of radius one over the hundred and the ball of radius a hundred. But then regardless of how we partition the space into cones with the vertex and the origin, inside each cone, the sets are going to be sandwiched between a ball of radius one over the hundred and the ball of radius a hundred. So they are going to be cone like. Um, so actually the first condition we can always satisfy. It's the second condition that's interesting. So we'd like to, the, from now on, the only thing that we care about is to produce a partition of the space into cones, so that inside each cone, the sets AI and BI have the same size. Okay. And perhaps let me take a step back and see what we are trying to achieve here. Well, we'd really like to produce a partition into arbitrarily narrow cones. Because in the second step of a proof, when we um, seek to establish a stability result for the sets AI and BI, we hope that if these cones are arbitrarily narrow, narrow on the scale of the 
boxes that make up A and B. We hope that inside these skulls, the sets A, I, and B, I look rather simple as they used to before. And perhaps we stand a better chance of proving a, a stability result for the sets A, I, and B, I. So with regards to the first step, we would really like to produce a partition into arbitrarily narrow curves. And in turn, we'd like to have a move that allows us to refine a partition into narrower and narrower curves. So here's the refining. Um, and let me describe it in three dimensions. Say we have a cone, CI. Um, we have a partition into cones, and one of these cones is good in the sense that inside this cone, CI, the sets AI and BI have the same size. And fix a line L that goes through the range. I claim that there exists a plane H through L, which partitions the cone CI into two smaller cones, such that in each of these smaller cones, the sets AI and BI have the same size. In other words, there exists a plane H through L, so that on each side of H, AI and BI have the same size. Why is this true? Well, it's essentially the proof is essentially one way. Just to rotate 180 degrees. Because start you can start with the plane in any position. Look on look on one side, look at this side of the plane H. Say that on this side the set the set AI is larger than the set BI, and then rotate the cone. 180 degrees around this line L. At the end, on the same side, the set AI will have size less than BI. Uh, so it must be that at some intermediate stage, the sets AI and BI have uh, uh, the same size on each side of H. Um, right, so we'd like to apply this move repeatedly. Um, to refine a partition into smaller and smaller curves. And the game that we play is the following. At each stage, we choose a cone CI. We choose the line to the wage. And then the enemy chooses a plane H through this line that divides the cone CI into two smaller curves. And the question is, can we play this game wisely to produce a nice partition into arbitrarily narrow curves? And one of our main results says that, indeed, we can play this game so that, in three dimensions at least, um, so, so that we, um, sorry, our result is in all dimensions, but I want to describe it in three dimensions. So we can play this game to um, partition the space into a bunch of cones, which fall into two, um, two categories. In the first category, we have cones that have a bounded number of faces, and are arbitrarily narrow. In the second category, we have cones that are trapezoidal in the sense that a sectional cut is a trapezoid, and that they are arbitrarily narrow in the direction of the base. Um, so the base of this uh, sectional cut is very small, but the side could potentially be long. Now, the whole reason we um, wanted to, open, to produce this partition into arbitrary narrow curves was the hope that the sets AI and BI inside these curves look rather simple. And we showed that, they, if we look at AI, we showed that in the, indeed the sets AI look simple as follows. In the first case on the left, Every section parallel to a given plane is either entirely contained in AI or is entirely disjoint from AI. And in the second case on the right, um, every fiber parallel to the base is either entirely contained inside AI or completely disjoint from AI. Now, this sets AI and BI are somewhat simpler than the original sets. And we hope to be in a better position to prove a Brun-Minkowski stability for this. 
and indeed one of our main results um, establishes a uh, Rolminkowski stability for for this uh, this type of set. And um, the point is that now we can glue all the pieces together and recover a sharp stability for the sets A and B themselves. Now, let me check how I'm doing one time. I see it's just about 50 minutes. Um, yeah, I should say a couple more, more things, a couple remarks. One is that um, actually, this um, um, though this set A, I, and B, I seem somewhat simpler, actually proving a sharp stability for them uh, turns out to be still quite difficult. And it represents an um, important component of our paper. Um, I want in my last few minutes, perhaps to mention a few open problems. So our main result says that if we are um, a one plus delta away from equality, then the symmetric difference between A and B is on the order of root delta over T times A. And our other main result says that if um, we are one plus delta away from equality, uh, the distance between A and its convex hole, similarly, the distance between B and its convex hole is on the order of delta times A. Now, it's natural to wonder what is the optimal dependency in T in this result? And um, the conjecture is that if um, TA plus one minus TB is at most one plus delta times A, then the distance between A and its convex hole should be on the order of T to the minus one delta times A, and the distance between B and its convex hole should be on the order of T to the minus D plus one times delta times A. Um, and one, if true, one can see that this is shy. By taking the following example, A is a Q and B is a Q plus a point near the um, middle of a face, or in vice versa, A is a Q plus a point um, near the middle of the face, and B is a, just a Q. Um, I mentioned one, one other conjecture, which is about the optimal multi, optimal uh, dimensional constant. Um, so the conjecture is that if A plus A over two is at most one plus delta times A, then the distance between A and its convex hole is on the order of two to the D over D times delta times A. And uh, perhaps in questions I'll say more about the uh, extremal example for this. Um, we're, we're, our result um, with um, uh, Hunter Spink and Peter Van Hintum um, and myself establishes this conjecture in a, a small dimension. And I think my time is almost up, so I'm going to stop somewhere here. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much, you. Marius. That was a great talk. Um, are there any questions? Would you mind uh, telling me a little bit more about this extremal example? Why, why the two to the D? Where does it come from? Right, so the extremal, extremal case here is the following. Let, I, I couldn't draw it, but let me see if I can explain it. So it's a cylinder. Uh, we, we take it to be a cylinder that has a subbase, a simplex. Um, and above the top base, let's say, of these cylinders, we consider D plus one points hovering above the base, one above each vertex of this simplex um, at the same height. If one does the calculation, it turns out that this would give two to the D over D. I see. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? If not, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you so much. Um, I'll stop recording yeah, now.